This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Each time I hear Woody Guthrie's words, I am brought back to Bayit Hill. The hill that overlooks Lac La Belle at Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute in Oconomowoc. I'm transported to a more carefree time where I'm lying on the grass, looking up at the fireworks, celebrating the 4th of July, listening in the background to the song leaders singing patriotic songs, including the one I just shared. I remember feeling so inspired by the words of the songs. This week, we read the last two portions in the book of Leviticus, Bahar the Chukotai. The reading begins with a discussion about laws pertaining to the promised land, the Shemitah, the sabbatical year that occurs every seventh year, where fields are to be left fallow and debts are to be released, and the Yovel, the jubilee year that occurs every 50 years, whereby no agricultural work was to be done, land was to revert back to its original owners, and all slaves were to be released. These were radical laws with radical economic consequences. It's fascinating to study how these laws are followed and also the loopholes that have been created to avoid economic ruin. However, I find it even more fascinating to think about the intention, the motivation behind these particular laws. As God describes the conditions that must be met for the Yovel, the Jubilee year, God says, Ki li ha'aretz, for the land is mine. Gerim v'toshavim atem imadi, you are but resident strangers with me. It turns out that this is not my land, nor is it your land. It's actually God's land. This notion that actually God is the owner and we are merely renters feels extreme. Perhaps we are tempted to think, sure, the land is technically God's. But I worked hard, and I earned my money, and I used that money to pay for the land. Or maybe my family worked hard and paid for the land, so really, it's mine. And if the land is rightfully mine, then I should be able to do what I want with it. The privilege of owning the land provides me with certain inalienable freedoms. You can see where this kind of thinking might lead us. Towards the end of Woody Guthrie's song, we find some lesser known verses. As I, wa- as I went walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. In the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people. By the relief office, I seen my people. As they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, Is this land made for you and me? Torah answers Guthrie's questions. Yes and no. Yes, the land is there for all of us to tend to and to enjoy, whether it be the wood for shelter, the produce for sustenance, or any of the natural resources that allow for us to survive and even to thrive. And no, the land was not made for you or for me, because ultimately it all belongs to God. So the land does not exist for any one person or any one group of people. And here's where the Torah's brilliance comes into play. It is precisely this attitude of individualism, that notion that I have the freedom to do what I please, when I please, no matter the consequence, from which the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, and the Yovel, the Jubilee year, protect society. The motivation, the intention behind these laws about letting the land rest and debts being forgiven and slaves being freed is to protect us from ourselves and from our impulses. No one individual's privilege or freedom is more important than the well-being of the whole. I pray that our society learns a lesson from this important piece of Torah. We are all really just renters here on God's land.
Wishing you and your family an early Shabbat Shalom.